Well, and we go a little a something like this. <laughs> Hit it. Right, one of the things I did yesterday to prepare for my extra homage today was uh, looked up a few national what is November the 3rd days. Okay. <laughs> So did John Doyle disconnect himself? <laughs> no, he, he spilled his coffee oh, all over oh, the table. You guys are paying too much homage. Oh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Hornby's not going to like that. Homage. <laughs> Colin, could you please get Mr. Doyle a diaper? <laughs> and some paper towels. <laughs> the diaper especially would be appreciated. Uh, and he's left us. All he's, right, he, was, he got mad and left. <laughs> no, he went uh, to get some paper towels. All right. <clears throat> Mr. Carl, you're up first on the uh, hit parade list of introductions. Yeah. First thing we do is kill all the lawyers, wrote one William Shakespeare. And those are words that every jurist doctorate should fear. We've come a long way since Bill the Bod scribed those lines. And the penalty now for cruelty to attorneys is probably at least a hefty fine. But Mike Carl, at this moment, it is those fears I seek to allay because Friday, November 3, is National Love Your Lawyer Day. All right. Thank you. Wow. Can you hug Mike? Mike. Can you guys hug Mike in a group? Uh, Just no. A group hug there? Just get your arms around the big guy there. Who, who, love. who came up with that day? <laughs> well, the lawyers. I didn't, I didn't even know about it. Yeah. November 3, National Love Your Lawyer Day. Wow. Right. All right, uh, Mike Hurt is up next. You know him as a delegate and the man killed in a gill-strap caper. I know him in a different way. To me, he's the mostly well-renowned prince of paper. And that's paper of all kinds, but I don't want to spoil it. And when I say all kinds, I mean even the kind that starts with toilet. <laughs> so, yep, to you, he might be the man known for his scowls. But to me, he's Mike Height, king of paper towels. Yeah. yeah. That order's in. We yeah, need an we, order. Yeah, yeah. Well, got that Doyle's thing. using up all the inventory. <laughs> <in the laughs> darn right. <laughs> I, I now work in props. I'm like a prop comic now. Doyle's helping me on the show. Right Mr. Doyle, you're up next here. Uh, Halloween came early to the Friday Five panel last week, and it was so frightening it made one of our group shriek. Though we were still four days away from trick-or-treating, it may have caused one poor heart to nearly stop beating. Indeed, last Friday, John Doyle gave the Senate president quite the scare when he actually agreed with something that was said by Mr. Craig Blair. <laughs> Craig said, John, please start disagreeing with me. Agreeing with you could cost me the election. And I immediately corrected it and, yes. Uh, Joseph, I, I, I just said, Craig, I lost my head, so shoot. There's another national day of celebration we observe you should know, whether you call it a grinder, a hoagie, a sub, or a hero. It's National Sandwich Day today, and hungry this does make me, as I topped off my mozzarella and gabagool sub with a sprinkle of aioli. <laughs> I know one thing about Joe Joey Torts Freddy, who's a stand-up fella. Whatever sandwich he makes will include some salt set and mortadella. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I could only go get good material like that, that that's... That's hard. It's hard to get that kind of stuff down here in the middle of Georgia. <laughs> I imagine in Georgia they go, you just mean ham and cheese, son? Or barbecue yeah, and grits. Cheesy, and grits. Yeah, cheesy grits. <laughs> Billy, today we also celebrate National Cliché Day. So in honor, we observe some sayings that just won't go away. And while it may be better to have loved and lost than to have never loved at all, unless you make that graffiti, and in that case the writing's on the wall... You might be scared out of your wits and made to feel like a dunce, but you can only truly be scared to death once. <laughs> we'll keep on celebrating no matter what they say, because that's just the way it is at the end of the day. So to close up this cliche fest and make it still rhyme, I introduce you to the Admiral, who, just like you and me, puts his pants on one leg at a time. <laughs> Happy cliche day, Bill. <laughs> well done, Rob. Well done. There, see, we, yeah, stand up all cheer. Homage, where's my homage? Homage, homage. I want, a, I want some extra homage. I want a take-home bag full of homage. In case I don't finish all my homage at dinner. All right, uh, lead-off hitter today, of course, as always, is Mr. Joseph Joey Tons Ferretti. Thanks, Rob. Uh, you know, I've been watching the news, as everybody else has, uh, and with a lot of dismay about this shooting up in Lewiston, Maine, where 31 people got shot up, 18 died, 13 injured. And interesting to see, of course, some of the information coming out after the shooting. And I noticed a theme uh, as this information was being uh, publicized nationwide. First of all, 
this fellow was a, a guardsman, and in his National Guard, uh, there were fellow reservists who were signed, uh, sounding warning signals about this fellow. Uh, one guardsman went to a uh, commandant in, in the uh, facility where they both worked and, and said, uh, hey, we need to lock up the gun locker because of a concern about this guy's behaviors. Uh, another guardsman actually contacted the sheriff uh, in Lewiston to uh, indicate that he was worried that this guy could snap someday and cause a mass shooting, quote unquote. Uh, the brother and father of this individual over the summer also warned the sheriff about uh, this family member's behaviors and they felt the shooter's ex-wife and son told the sheriff about an incident where the shooter went to his brother's house and secured as many as 15 guns over the summer. So the theme I noticed in all this is uh, is this. First of all, there was a concern about this fella possessing guns. And the second theme was that there were repeated reports to law enforcement authorities and others about this man's aberrant behaviors. So that immediately brought to mind the issue of red flag laws, which are designed to address those two concerns, the possession of guns in the hands of people who exhibit mental instability. 21 states in this country have red flag laws. Uh, there are uh, laws pending in a couple state legislatures right now. So we're, the momentum is towards establishing red flag laws, and soon we'll have probably half of the country with those kinds of protections. I wonder if those protections would have worked for the state of Maine, which in 2019, their legislature rejected a red flag law. As we know, uh, the red flag laws, or sometimes called extreme risk protection orders, are designed to do two things. One, uh, address the concern of somebody who is uh, suffering from mental illness, from uh, handling a gun or possessing a gun, and secondly, granting due process to that individual, since we do have a Second Amendment right regarding gun ownership. Uh, the way they work is they temporarily deprive the individual of the gun or guns that he or she may have. Uh, once they're adjudicated to be in need of mental health counseling, maybe a psychiatric help, uh, by the way, the shooter in Maine was in a psychiatric hospital for two weeks prior to this. So I, I, I think we continue need to need to – well, let me say that again. We need to continue debating this issue about red flag laws and decide whether or not it's appropriate for our state and whether it is a tool in the toolbox to, again, uh, try to – at least assure some safety in, pub, in the public, to assure us that, of being able to go to malls and theaters without fear of being get, getting uh, gunned down by somebody who should not have a gun. It's not perfect. I know there's going to be concerns about the execution of the law, but I think in theory we still need to debate whether the law itself is something that we need to have. So that's my question this morning. All right, good question to start the crew off here. John Dool, you raised your hand first. You wanted the first uh, shot at this one. Um, uh, first, a question, uh, uh, Joe, to you and to Mike Carl, because you all might know the answer to this. Maine does have something called a yellow flag law, and uh, it apparently didn't work in this case, but what is the difference between a red flag law and a yellow flag law? Do either of you know? Because I, I don't. I, yeah. I, I can answer that, John, because you're correct. It is called a yellow flag law. It was a compromise in the main legislature, and it is very cumbersome in order to get an extreme risk protection order from a court because it required two levels of uh, testimony from physicians, from MDs, about the mental instability, the mental health issues concerning the subject or the individual who is being brought before the courts. Uh, so it, it was, it, it is a protection. However, it was not a streamlined process where law enforcement or, and the courts could act 
expeditiously to deal with situations where somebody is, um, is suffering from mental illness. It was seen as too cumbersome in this okay. case. And I think the main legislature, the momentum now is they're going to revisit that law and see if they cannot uh, establish more protocols to act quickly rather than uh, what they have currently. Yeah, and Jared Golden, who represents that part of Maine in the U.S. House of Representatives, had opposed red flag laws before, and now as a result of this, he said he's changed his mind. He now supports them. And incidentally, full disclosure, a couple of years ago, uh, I sponsored a red flag law uh, in in our legislature. It didn't go anywhere. I, I didn't even ask for it to be put on the agenda of the Judiciary Committee because I know I knew it would be would be uh, 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 even if it were up. It would be voted down unanimously on that committee, but I did uh, introduce one just to kind of uh, raise the question. Mike Heights. You know, uh, my first take on this is, you know, we have to do something. But at the same time, was this because we didn't have a red flag law in, in Maine, or was this just a, a failure to act um, with with everybody in that community? People were warned, and, and they did nothing. And, and you may say, well, what could they have done? Well, there were things they could have done. They, if they have a yellow flag law, they could have started the process. They didn't even start the process in this particular case. There were all kinds of warning signs with this particular individual, and no action was taken. So I, I don't see this as uh, additional legislation needed. I see this as the the people who are in charge when when somebody comes to you with these issues there has to be a duty to act and it seemed to me like there was a lack of of action in this particular case um and and even if there were red flag laws how i'm sort of wondering how did this guy go back and get guns from his brother if his brother come and took him and and he had didn't have access to him how did he get access again did he go buy one? What was? How did he get access to this particular weapon? And and I don't know the the, the answer to that. Um, I can't imagine his brother would have come and taken half of his guns and left some behind. That wouldn't have made sense either. Um, you know, we don't have red flag laws here in West Virginia, but yet we do have mechanisms to take weapons away from people if they are deemed dangerous at different times. I've seen it happen. My concern with red flag laws is that that. Uh, that you you have to have your due process before your rights are taking taken away, and I don't know that I think maybe red flag laws take those rights away before there's a due process. So I think you have to be very careful when you write this kind of legislation. But they only take them away temporarily, while you while you're evaluating the situation. Okay, so I should be able to take your freedom of speech away temporarily because I don't like what you're saying. There, these are inherent rights that we have been given. So if you're going to take them away, you have to have due process to take them away. You have to have a reason. That, that's correct. Uh, and you can take my freedom of speech away, not because you don't like what I say, but because I might break the rules when I'm when I'm going about it. Uh, it's it's uh, like, like a court saying, hey, we got a case here. You can't talk about this case out in public. There, there, no, no. A uh, guaranteed right in the Constitution is absolute. But you, None of them. But you've had a certain due process in that particular case. If you're talking about a court of law and you're, there's a gag order and, or whatever. And you've, you've had, had due, due process. process. And you've had due process before your gun is taken away temporarily. No. There's a, oh, yeah, there's a procedure why, whereby uh, somebody with knowledge has to go to the police and say, this person is a danger. The police investigate. And if the police think that, that there is, is enough chance that the accusation is correct, then you can take the guns away temporarily while it is further investigated. I've seen here in Berkeley County guns taken away from individuals before the investigation just solely based on somebody else's uh, assertion that they're dangerous or they're physically violent or whatever, and the police come and take their guns out of their house before any investigation at all. The guns leave, and then there's an investigation. Well, well then we, we don't have a red flag law, so that... But those clearly things, doesn't apply there. Well, but it would because the red flag laws would allow that to be even easier. 
Now, let's go to Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, this conversation between uh, uh, John and Mike, I think, is a reflection of what we're talking about in society today. Uh, we're on the record of having more mass shooting this year than we've had since it started going in 2014 when it first started. We have more than 565 mass shootings today. Uh, the record is around 680. Uh, we'll surpass that record. Uh, if anything that people resist is an intrusion upon their perceived rights. The old saying is your right ends when, when your fist hits my nose or something like this. Uh, the, uh, the statistics show there are more mass shootings in those states that do not have red flag laws, laws than, than in the states that do have red flag laws. Uh, we're becoming so hardened now. Uh, it's not like the shooting in Sandy Hook, the shooting in uh, uh, Marjorie Stone and Douglas, uh, 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 am I right there? You have school in, in Florida. Yeah, you got it right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we're, we're becoming so hardened. We've taken the attitude of, well, I'm not going to worry about it until it happens in my backyard. At that time, then I become nervous about it. I really find this to be the wrong way to go. Uh, the red flag laws, in my view, are the simplest, the not the least intrusive position we could take that would not solve the problem, but it might help in solving the problem. But the fact that there is this wall put up, it encroaches somewhat on my Second Amendment rights, therefore you cannot touch it, is of a valent thought, and I don't see that this problem is going to be solved. Mike Carl. Well, I have a, it'll be surprising to most of you, uh, I strongly support red flag laws. In fact, uh, to, to, to um, or you know, view is similar. The freedom of speech and the right to bear arms is 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 absurd. Uh, the the right to bear arms is talking about uh, an individual having access to something that can harm others. In fact, it, its main purpose and some views is to harm others. And so I think there ought to be a preemptive. Uh, uh, examination and qualification, just like we have to drive a car on the highway, a dangerous thing, you know. Uh, I, 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 I think uh, the interpretation of uh, that there shouldn't be some, you know, uh, test or preemptive consideration of a person's uh, mental capacity and willingness to, to abide by the law and not kill people, you know, with, with, uh, is a significant limitation on the constitutional right to bear arms. It, can I go back very uh, sure. quickly? Something you said earlier, Mike Height, uh, was that it's uh, uh, that we in Berkeley County, the police goes in and can take the guns away from someone before an investigation. In many regards, that to me is a lot more frightening than red flag logs. That is, that opens the door for a massive intrusion of one's rights. Uh, just because someone calls the police and said, my neighbor has guns, I don't like my neighbor, the police goes in and takes his guns away without any any legal foundation foundation due process that, yeah without any due process at all that to me is a lot is a lot more frightening than red flag law and i I'm, I'm not calling for that no i know i'm, I know, but I'm due I, process I, yeah I, I agree but yeah. i think he I, meant the I, other I, mic i believe yeah. the red flag laws allow that to happen it gives them an opportunity for that to happen more frequently if without the due process in uh portion of it imposed and i just uh, real quick i got a a text from mark tom who's the nra regional director um, for this area and his response is if someone is so dangerous to themselves or others that we need to have an item taken away why are we leaving them with other deadly instruments why aren't we taking away the actual item in the scenario which is deemed a danger we should be taking the person for an immediate mental evaluation that takes any concern of due process out of the equation. That's even more frightening to me. Yeah, I don't. That, uh, that I don't. Ups it. Yeah, it, it won't ups it. I don't like Mike Mike Height. I think he's a uh, raven lunatic. I, I so, knew you felt that way. Yeah, I know. So I'm, <laughs> <laughs> and I can call Mike because Mike is a very close friend. I have phenomenal regard for Mike Height. But using him for an example, I don't like Mike. I'm gonna call in. So this guy should be locked up. So they come in, they pick him up, they lock him up. You 
Put that. And in, then you have to prove that you're well, not insane. Right. You we're put not, that in comparison to a red flag log. Which of the two is less invasive? We're not talking about locking him up. We're talking about doing an, an immediate evaluation. Before you take somebody's rights away, you need to – that's part of the investigation. You need to be able to investigate that what is being charged should happen. So why are you taking rights away from him before you've investigated and evaluated that this person is a danger to society? If this person in Maine had been taken and had an immediate evaluation, people would have found out this guy's crazy. We do need to act. That's what a red flag law does. It looks at one's background, see if there is a red flag that they should not be given a gun. That's but, exactly what it does. But the red flag law takes the guns, takes the right first, and does the investigation second. Can we go back to Joe Ferretti for a final word here? Well, I, I think what we're debating, which is often the case when debating red flag laws, is it's all about the execution of the laws, right? It's about when the hearing is going to be held. Is it immediate? Uh, do, do we haul the guy down to a, a, a courtroom where a mental hygiene commissioner sits there and, and the judge is the person uh, in terms of mental stability? Uh, do we take the guns right away or not? And who can file the, that petition? Is a warrant required? Uh, you know, how, how long would the guns be deprived? Uh, and how do you restore possession? All this is in the execution of the law. But the law itself is just a tool. It's something else that we can emphasize with county sheriffs. And Mike Heights right, the county sheriff up in Maine needs to be scrutinized heavily here because of all these warnings that went unheeded. But it gives these law enforcement folks, it gives the local courts the tool to perhaps interdict and avoid these these uh, mass shootings in some instances. It's not going to be uh, – uh, foolproof, that's for sure. But it's something that we can another, – another tool to use to perhaps avoid some of these incidents. Uh, so I, I think the debate has to be twofold. One, do we somehow craft a law that allows for such interdiction? And then secondly, okay, how do we go about executing that law? And I think the debates will, will be longstanding in terms of the execution. And I'm all for that because we want to assure due process. But to have a law itself, at least some other option available for the courts and law enforcement, I think, is a debate we first have to have. And I'm, I, in my opinion, I'm glad at least 21 states now have decided it's the way to go. But I can tell you, looking at other states' laws, they vary in terms of how they execute those laws. And I'm, I'm wondering, and I think it's possible that West Virginia can craft a law that's executed to protect the rights of all citizens. I think there ought to be some at least civil liability for failure to execute the law if it's your duty under the law to execute it. On that note, we'll wrap up this segment. As always, Joe, good job kicking off the show for us. And uh, program note, we will have Art Tom on the show Monday at 9 a.m. right after the break there, too. You can tune in for more on red flag laws and such at that time. Our uh, panel today includes Mr. Ferretti and uh, in studio, the Badger, Michael Heights. Good morning, sir. Mr. Michael Carl, senior member to the community. Good morning. And Mr. Stubblefield. Good morning. Mr. Doyle. Good morning. You dried up yet? <laughs> Towel off. <laughs> now see, now there's an accusation. That <laughs> but a well documented accusation. <laughs> it happened live on camera. There's no guy. Well, no. It. There are ways that that could be interpreted out there in radio and TV land. But yeah. You didn't answer the question though. Yeah. Have you dried off? You good? Are you good yet? You're still. Right. I've been good. They didn't know the, the extent I, of the I didn't spill. get any coffee on me. Oh, okay. I All we know. have is I'm, I'm still yawning a little bit because of the 17 drops of coffee 17. that I didn't get to drink. <laughs> <laughs> that looked like more than 17 drops yeah, to me. It took at least 17 towels to drop those 17 drops. <laughs> two towels. Two towels. <laughs> All right. For issue number two, we go to the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Uh, good morning, Rob. Again, uh, last last week we had Jackie Long and Pat Murphy on talking about school issues. Uh, and 
qualifier or not a qualifier, but an observation up front. Uh, I think the our local school board is doing a great, great job. And from the our contact, uh, our listeners, they all echo that. So both Jackie, Pat, and the colleagues get high marks from at least the folks that I hear and talk about. But during that discussion, we heard mention all nothing's new, but we heard mention again the problem the schools are facing: truancy, the graduate, some uh, artificial graduation in some cases, uh, discipline problem, security in the schools, uh, construction issues that needs to be done. A lot of problems that the schools are facing. Uh, also, uh, recently, Berkeley County uh, failed in three of the SAT score categories. We're one of, uh, among the highest in the state and those failures uh, we as a state we are we recognize we're among the lowest as far as achieving our educational goals but yet we pay put more in per capita per student uh, funding than probably any other state in the nation these things don't match up to me they uh, we we spend a lot of money yet we're getting very poor results uh, one of the uh, questions I had the other day or posed are we having too many cooks in the fire uh, or in the kitchen rather uh, and and I'm going to raise a subject that I admittedly do not know very much about. I'm raising, and I do not have an opinion. I'm, I'm curious to get the opinion of my colleagues around the table. And that is a state board of education. Are they a constructive unit? Uh, are they, do we need a state board of education along with a very productive county board of education? Do they work well together? Is, are they getting in the way of each other? And a kind of a basic, uh, the, the root of all the question is why, as a state, are we doing so poorly in education than, uh, uh, than other states? And please don't give me the answer. It's because of n no f uh, parent involvement. Sure, I'm sure that's a contributor, but we've been using that as an excuse of trying to address any other problems, of finding a workaround if that's the issue. And we can assume that that's the case in many states, not just West Virginia. I, I and and we're using it as an excuse not to take any any other action. We draw back on the old premise. Well, it's a, the, some of the parents are not doing their job. Therefore, we do not have to take a hard look at what we're doing. All right, Mr. Mr. Doyle. Uh, yeah, the um, I Bill. I'm glad you raised this. To me, it is a problem. It has been for ever since I got elected to the legislature the first time in 1982. Uh, West Virginia has the most highly centralized public education system of any state except Hawaii. Hawaii has one statewide school district. They're even more highly centralized than we are. Um, uh, every state has a state board of education, but most of them, uh, uh, the, the, all of the others have less power in relation to the local boards than is the case in West Virginia. And uh, we, in, in fits and starts, uh, there, there has been, I think, some progress in the direction of giving a little bit more power to the local boards of education. But it's, it's and I've heard Craig Blair say this an awful lot, in, in many areas of public policy, you have people that run for office saying, I want more local control. And as soon as they get in, they say, well, you know, I don't want to give these people more local control because they might decide something I don't like. And that uh, uh, I, I, I will pat myself on the back. I never took that attitude. Uh, I've always been for more local control. I was the we had a bill in the legislature a couple of years ago, which finally said that the uh, that the legislature could have oversight authority over the rulings of the State Board of Education. Uh, they had been exempted from that. All the other agencies of state government were under the oversight authority of the legislative branch, which is a normal way of doing things in Republican government, uh, in the American-style government. And so I was the only Democrat to vote for it. Uh, but there were some Republicans that voted against it too, uh, some of whom had said they were for local control. So I, uh, 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 that is where we need to go. I think you, 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 you're pointing your, uh, the, uh, your eraser at the right person to throw it to. 
uh, in the classroom. Uh, that I get that there's an old story about that. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I had a, I had a, a, a teacher one time who was really good at throwing an eraser at somebody in the room in the back of the room that was causing trouble, and and he was dead on. I mean, it would stay, hit that stay person. On, stay on point here, John. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah. The answer is, Bill. Uh, you're going in the right direction, and rah, rah, rah. All right, Mr. Ferretti. <clears throat> well, I, I guess if we're not going to have a state board of education, which some people advocate uh, that we dissolve, uh, I just want to know who's going to take over what they do. Because my understanding, and I'll, be, I'll stand to be corrected if I'm wrong about this, but my understanding is that they set, the agenda for what will be the curriculum that is taught statewide. There's some uniformity to the curriculum, and the State Board of Education assures of, uh, us of that. Uh, they also, uh, and I assume the governor appoints uh, qualified people for this job, uh, they also uh, develop, help develop the, uh, uh, the discipline policy, the policies regarding uh teacher retention and, and things of that nature. Uh, so to some degree, there is centralized management of our school system. And my question is to those who think we should get rid of the State Board of Education is, okay, who takes over some of those functions then? Do we give that to the legislature, which would give me pause? Uh, do we just hand it over to the county school superintendents to develop this? And then how do we manage 55 counties in terms of their curriculum and uh, the other things that uh, a centralized management system handles. So I, I, I just want to know what the alternative is if we don't have a State Board of Education. That being said, I, I'm not altogether sure what uh, all the roles that the State Board of Education fills in terms of managing our schools. I would like to learn more about that, but still, I, I have to believe that some centralized management is necessary when you're dealing with 55 different school systems. And then on a local level, many, many school uh, systems within that county. I, I just think we have to have, in terms of curriculum and other issues, some centralized management. But if not the State Board of Education, who? That's my question. Mike Carl, I'll be happy to answer your question. and The meter will not be running. <clears throat> it's too important to hold up. Um, the answer is what Amendment 4 would, would have done, which is we do, yeah, we do need central, you know, uh, management, uh, just like we have with every other government function, you know. But every other government function is subject to legislative oversight representatives of you know the collective representatives of the people and that's exactly what we needed and that's exactly what the teachers union opposed obvious for obvious reasons and that's exactly what governor justice opposed because the teachers union opposed so uh, we simply need uh, that amendment that the just like all other important government functions and, and agencies uh, at the, the state level needs to be ultimately accountable responsible to the legislator legislature the people's representatives mr height well first of all joe don't assume that the governor is appointing people who are qualified for these positions <laughs> That's been shown to be false. Yeah, that was correct. a big part of Eric Tarr's diatribe yeah. last week. Yeah. Um, but but I, I'm going to agree with, with John and Mike that, that there is no oversight of this. The, the State Board of Education is considered the fourth branch of government in the state of West Virginia. There is no oversight. They don't answer to the people. Every, everywhere else, including my seat um, in the House of Representatives, John, when he was there as well as a delegate, we are subject to the the people's uh, approval of our job, and every two years, if they don't like what we're doing, um, the, the people can speak out. the The state board of education has no oversight whatsoever, and I'm going to agree with Mike. They they have to have some kind of oversight. They could 
the, we do need to have some kind of centralization for certain things, and maybe curriculum is one. But then the legislature should be able, if they come in and say we're we're going to continue on with Common Core, and there's been outrage from the people for for years now that they don't like Common Core. Uh, they don't believe Common Core is is the way to go. It's not teaching our, our children properly, and we need to try something different. And yet the State Board of Education says, no, we're going to continue on with Common Core. There's no recourse. The legislatures can't say, no, you need to come up with another system. You need to either go back to the old system or you need to come up with something different. But there needs to be some kind of oversight over the decisions that they make. And, John, I agree with you. I would much rather see it like other states do it, where it goes to the local control. There's more Mm -hmm. local – and – Bill, I agree with you. Our Board of Education here in Berkeley County, I believe, is doing a fantastic job. So if they had more control over what is is mandated, um, then I, th- I think we would have a better product here in Berkeley County. But their hands are tied by the State Board of Education, and they can't do what they want as much. Would Amendment and, 4 have addressed that problem? I yes, the, the legislative oversight. Yeah. That, that would have addressed part of the problem, uh, but it still wouldn't have addressed a whole lot of issues relating to local control. There are other things that we need to do, and I did want to point out, Mike, Carl, that uh, uh, the, the opposition of the teachers' organizations is not the only reason that Jim Justice opposed it. I think Jim Justice opposed it also because uh, he liked likes the fact that the power is in the hand of, hands of, of these friends of his that he's appointed to the State Board of Education. So I wanted to throw that in. But that's some of it, too. But I don't think even even after he appoints them, and, and here's the other weird thing, is they get nine-year appointments. That's, that's yeah. ludicrous. No, nobody else gets a nine-year appointment. <laughs> nobody can serve as governor for nine years. Right. <laughs> exactly. And then I don't, I don't believe, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe that they serve at the will and pleasure of the governor. Once he appoints them, they're there. And, and it was done so that a a, uh, a a a newly elected governor couldn't automatically fire everybody on the state board and appoint brand new people that is the reason for the nine-year term i think that's too long uh, i think probably six years uh would be right and that way you know you get you get and they're staggered they're so sure. in, in, in yeah every time a new governor gets elected that governor now gets to appoint uh, a, th- a third of the board they would still be able to do that if they were six-year terms sure. yeah final word goes back to you bill i've learned a lot thanks much all right issue number three the badger all right i'm gonna to go to uh more international stuff um and and local uh my question is what does the large number of anti-semite protests on college campuses say about higher education in the u.s all right let's start first with mike carl on this one michael well, that, that's that's kind of related to, to to my issue, so I have to use a different one. But I'll, <laughs> I'll throw it in. Uh, it, it, it 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 it's it says that it, it, that they're they're failing tremendously uh, to uh, 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 enable a system, you know, a, a movement that that hates Israel, hates Jews. And it's it's absolutely ridiculous. It's antagonistic to American values and principles, and and that's it, it's an important area. But it's just one of the areas where a lot of higher ed is failing. But they, it's 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 a manifest example right now in our world of how the higher education system is is failing in terms of what it's encouraging or allowing, and the little pushback that we're starting to see from higher ed against this is you know it's uh, i hope it's not too little too late but it's certainly too late there are some donors pulling major funds from some large universities bill yeah i think we make a mistake by painting everybody with the same brush uh there are four five six schools that i've heard of that there's uh, that this has become a major issue and semitism and that would be uh, cornell harvard university of pennsylvania and a few others but that does not include schools like wvu shepherd university uh, mo- many of the schools out west so it's a mistake i think to paint everybody with the same brush uh, is our uh, uh, are we failing our students? Uh, let's look back before 
I was born, uh, the uh, late 1930s, there was a major activity on the part of the universities against uh, uh against getting involved in Europe and what was happening in Europe. And we saw what happened a couple of years down the road with invasion of, uh, of Pearl Harbor, invasion of uh, Poland and the like. Uh, we can fast forward to the mid-1960s, uh, early 1960s Vietnam. The university campuses were very, very involved, much more so uh, than what we're seeing with these five or six or seven people that have uh, voiced against uh, the Jewish race in Israel. Uh, so I would, I don't, do not believe that our higher education is failing us. Our, our higher education uh, provides an opportunity for people to express their views one way or the other. There are other ways to exact a penalty for these vocal groups and that's what's been done by businesses now businesses are saying we will not hire the individuals that are outspoken uh that to me is a much more effective way to curb what someone does not like a particular speech uh which is all covered under the first amendment anyway uh then it is say we go in and give penalties to a certain university so again i caution that we do not let this brush that's painting the picture get too broad mr doyle yeah i agree with bill uh it's a very small number of of uh, institutions where this happens and i think so far every one i've heard of has been a private institution i've yet to see one on any any public college or university that doesn't mean there haven't been some but uh, at any rate and secondly in on these institutions at these institutions where this has happened it's a tiny minority of the student body that's involved uh and uh the i think a much greater problem that we have uh related to uh the situation in the middle east right now is over the last year uh incidents uh violent incidents of anti-semitism have increased almost 400 percent in this country since october 7th violent incidents of islamophobia have increased something like 250 percent this is what we need to worry about not somebody on a college campus that that's that's read a couple of books and and thinks he or she now knows everything and wants to make a speech about it joe well uh first of all uh Jewish students on, on campuses across this country should be able to feel secure and safe in their environment. They should be able to freely walk around campus without threats. They should not be the subject of online threats or veiled threats or graffiti or all those things. And every campus in this country has a duty to those students to make sure that they feel safe. Uh, that being said, uh, we, we are, aren't we running into this pesky little discussion about constitutional rights? Uh, if somebody wants to speak out against the Israelis' incursion into the uh, Gaza Strip and the uh, what they claim to be indiscriminate bombing and harming of innocents, that is a discussion we need to have. Uh, that's free speech. And I don't think the campuses should be abridging free speech. But when it crosses the line into threats against the security and safety of a certain group of students, that has to be responded to forcefully. And I mean with prosecutions, expulsion from school, you name it. That cannot be tolerated. And, and I, I know the Biden administration has already tasked Homeland Security to work with various campus police units throughout the country to assure students of their safety. And I know that there's going to be civil rights prosecutions over this. Uh, but still, uh, we have to also recognize that as vile or as wrongheaded we think some of these pronouncements are uh, regarding this uh, situation in the Middle East, it is still free speech. And on that note, I go back to Mike Kite for a final thought. So I, I would agree with you, Joe, that th you have to allow free speech on campuses. Um, it's concerning, though, that these are the Ivy League schools. It, you're right, Bill. It's not across all all schools of higher education, but it's the, it's the Ivy League schools. So what are they being taught at these Ivy League schools that institutes such um, – 
anti-Semitism and, and anti-Semitism at the level that I never thought I would see again. I mean, there there has been some of these protests, pro-Palestinian protests, have welcomed in neo-Nazi protesters into their, I mean, you, you have a fascist group and a liberal group um, coming together uh, for anti-Semitism reasons. And, and it's just baffling if we study history and, and, and the Holocaust and things like that. It's, it seems like it's always the Jewish population that, that we're going after. Um, and I didn't see all these protests when, against Russia on college campuses when they invaded Ukraine. But I, I see it in spades for pro-Palestinian and anti-Semitism. So it's always, it's, it seems like there's something being taught um, at some level that is, is against Israel or, or Jews in general. Yeah, I don't know what's been taught by do it, but I, I'm a firm believer that we have to pay attention to history. And the uh, the the anti-Semitism in, in Germany uh, did not happen overnight. It happened gradually, but, it, but in the late 20s, early 30s, it had reached a fairly significant peak. We have to guard against anything like Which that. Which is what I think is happening yep. here. We've yep. sort of just uh, ignored <clears throat> it. For, for a long time, the, the, the words of a Louis Farrakhan, who we've just sort of ignored for years and years and years, but maybe his message is reaching far more people um, and, and youthful individuals than that what we, we had anticipated. You may be right, Mike, but that's the first time I've heard his name mentioned in years and years. Uh, his teaching may still be there. I don't have any idea, but he's no longer the symbol that he was back in the uh, uh, early 70s. Via telephone, Joseph, Joey Torts Ferretti, and studio, Mike Height, Mike Carl, Bill Stubblefield, and the sole issuer of issue number four, Jonathan Doyle. I'm not Jonathan. You are right now. <laughs> Gee whiz. Jonathan. When, when you're on this show, you're, you're, you're basically a prisoner. <laughs> Jonathan, the door is locked from the outside. Yes, I see. Jonathan G. Doyle. Go right ahead. Yeah. Anyway, uh, day before yesterday, the United States House of Representatives considered a motion uh, sponsored by uh, about a half a dozen uh, uh, Republican members to uh, uh, kick George Santos out of uh, the House of Representatives. Uh, it failed. It got a majority. It got all the Democrats and 24 Republicans, but it did not get the two-thirds majority necessary uh, to evict someone from uh, that body. So my question is, and it applies to both George Santos and Robert Menendez, the senator from uh, New Jersey, who uh, uh, w it was fairly recently discovered uh, was under uh, under contract with the uh, with uh, with Egypt uh, to uh, to do some work. We're not sure exactly what. My question is: Should either or both of these be uh, expelled from the U.S. Congress? Uh, and my answer is no. And I say that even though all the Democrats voted to expel George Santos, I think they were mistaken. There have been five people in our country's history expelled by uh, either the House or the Senate. And, and the Constitution says that they are judges of their own members. They may expel them. And the Constitution doesn't spell out, you know, what the rules are. It's just, do you expel or do you not? But tradition, and it is solid, uh, the five who have been kicked out every, in every single case were people who had already been convicted of a crime. And neither of these two has yet been convicted of a crime. Now, um, Mike Lawler, the uh, congressman from New York, who was one of the sponsors of this, along with Lalota, Desposito, Williams, and I, I forget the other two. A anyway, uh, Lawler said that, he pointed out that Santos's treasurer has already been convicted of misuse of money, which it's pretty obvious that Santos had to be involved in. I, I accept that that's some pretty strong evidence that can be used in Santos's case, but his case hasn't come up yet. And he has not been convicted. So that is my view, and I throw it out to the panel as to see what theirs are. Go to the telephone first with Joe Ferretti. Well, I, I think some of these members of Congress, when they cast the vote not to expel 
another member, their attitude is, you know, they're but for the grace of God go I. Uh, so I, they, they don't want to create a precedent, I think, where a good uh, point. they start booting out people left and right for nefarious conduct. Uh, yeah, it's correct. Neither one of those individuals you cite, John, ha- has been convicted yet of, of a crime, uh, though we can anticipate that might be coming. I think the frustration is it takes too darn long to get these people uh, adjudged and, and to get a conviction. And uh, so should Congress act in advance of what is a very protracted and lengthy process to get a conviction? I don't know. Perhaps in some instances it should, but uh, I think therein lies the problem. It, it, it just Menendez has been skirting a conviction or being judged uh, for years. Uh, this is not his first rodeo as far as uh, questionable conduct. And, and so I think that frustration kind of uh, is part of one of the reasons why Congress has such a low rating. So that, that's my concern is that it just takes too long to, to figure out what, in fact, these guys, how they've crossed the line. Mike Height. Uh, I would agree with you, Joe, but I, I'm also a big proponent of people are due their day in court and that we don't um, judge them prematurely um, and and that we don't they I'm agreeing with John here that they should not have been um, taken out of their positions they should not have been voted out of their positions in Congress because they haven't had their day in court they have not been convicted of a crime at this point so we need to give them the opportunity to to get you know give their rebuttal why they don't think that they should be removed or why they they don't think that they're guilty um, before we act and just remove them. I I would agree with Joe, though, that sometimes these things do take way, way too long. Um, But at the same time, um, they're innocent until proven guilty. And if they are innocent at this point, um, until somebody proves them in a court of law that they're guilty, then they should not be removed from their position. Mr. Carl. Well, I, I, I agree with the last statement Mike made. Uh, and keep in mind that uh, there, need, there needs to be a, a, a clear trigger to uh, remove someone who was you know, elected. But they're, they're punished already, two points. They're punished already because of the disclosure of all the scandals and, and problems they have, fa- they're facing and the charges. And in a mem- the members of the House, it's just every third year anyway. I mean, they're going to clearly they're going to lose in the next election because of these things, almost inherently. And and so so uh, I I agree that that you need a, a formal trigger like a, a conviction before you can be removed from a, your elected office. William. Yeah. In the case of the Santos, there was a vote without a trial. Unlike what we saw in Texas, where the attorney general was actually tried by the uh, by the state senate, and uh, uh, he was not, even though the majority uh, felt he had done wrong, there was not enough to kick him out of his job. Uh, we did not have that with U.S. Senate. We've, I mean, excuse me, U.S. House. Uh, they just took a vote without any real trial. And in the case of Menendez, Menendez they have not even done that yet. They're just, uh, they're just. I think they're doing it more to appease the public, trying to buy some favorite vibes from the public more than anything else. Plus, as Mike Carl so aptly pointed out, uh, I think uh, Santis is a dead duck. Uh, during next election, uh, Bob Menendez is probably the same way. Neither one will be reelected. Yeah, and Menendez is up this time, yeah. so it's a uh, uh, and and uh, something else to to point out. Just a little technical information here in the House, uh, when if you're expelled, there is 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 a special election, you know, and you are allowed to run in that special election. Uh, Charlie Rangel did that. Adam Clayton Powell did that. Two of the people who were thrown out uh, simply ran in the next special election and got back in again. So, uh, yeah, I thank you all. I, I believe we should just wait for the election. <laughs> then to issue number five with Mike Carl. Well, I want to go back to the uh, anti-Israeli demonstrations and so forth. Um, just, and just to give a little context of what my point is. 
uh, uh, I, I grew up in Hampshire County, West Virginia. The only Jew in the whole county uh, had a men's clothing store, but he was also the mayor of, of Romney for a long time. My mother and my parents were Democrats, and my mother worked for as his main staffer in, you know, in his mayor's office for decades. So, uh, and yet today, I would suspect that the Democratic, that, that there's a huge portion of the people who are involved in these uh, uh, anti Israeli uh, demonstrations are otherwise are voting liberal voters are, are voting voting for the far left agenda that, that wherever they can find it and so i'm going to call them dinos democrats in name only because the democratic party i i will acknowledge was far more uh, aggressive and 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 worthy in in defending and as, asserting the rights of of Jews than the Republicans were long ago. So, so I'm just throwing out that see if you agree with my analysis. Now, my question is: You chose to go the Flintstone route with the Dino as opposed to the rhyming it with a rhino and the Dino. <laughs> No, you called him. Yeah, Dino. you did. <laughs> no, uh, D- D- Dino, Democrat, name him only. Yeah. Dino. Dino. Okay. Dino. I, mean, I, 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 did, I didn't use the I the right I, I, I didn't emphasize. Personally, I approve of the Dino because the Flintstones was a great cartoon. So okay, that, was, that, okay. that dinosaur was a great cartoon. All right. Dog. I meant Dino. But... I'm all right with either one, though. All right, uh, Mr. Stubblefield, you've been called a rhino by several people. I, Why don't you yell at I, some people about being a dino? Yeah, and I and I never took objection to it because I <laughs> thought I was doing right. Carl, Carl got was, called a rhino when yeah. he said he was in favor of red flag laws yeah, on and, our website. And Mike called me a rhino many years. Years or so ago, so I had to become independent just because of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've not seen any statistics to uh, to support what Mike is saying, uh, and I do not know if the uh, uh, if these folks on college campuses are overly liberal or libertarian or just don't care, don't have any political party at all. I don't have any idea what they are. Uh, I do not believe that the, uh, uh, the Democratic Party uh, is any more anti-Israel than what the Republican Party is. I don't know. I have not seen any numbers to it. Uh, I think we uh, we need support of I think we need support of the Ukraines. We need support of the Israels, Israelis during this pretty critical time. Mr. Doyle, uh, I I know thousands of Democrats in Jefferson and Berkeley County, around West Virginia, and around the country. Uh, mo- uh, everyone I've talked to uh, believes that Israel has the, an absolute right to defend itself. Um, the question is, uh, how wisely are they going about it uh, at the moment? There's where the difference of opinion is. I saw a poll a couple days ago. A big majority of Americans under 30 support the Palestinian cause as opposed to the Israeli cause. Uh, That is the that is a, a people over 30 overwhelmingly support Israel. People under 30 overwhelmingly support the Palestinians. Uh, and I don't think it has to do with the DNR. My guess is most of these people who are who are vocally supporting Palestinians are, are registered uh, for with minor parties: uh, the Socialist Party, the the Green Party. Uh, I, yeah, I I don't I don't talk to people who are registered Democrats that uh, that that uh, uh, that are anti-Israel. No, Mr. Ferretti. Well, I think a, a lot of Democrats uh, have advocated, and this goes back through the years of the Obama administration, a, a two-state solution in the Middle East where the Palestinians would have uh, guaranteed territory and, and would, uh, rights and boundaries and all that sorts of things. And, and uh, that's been elusive uh, as a uh, Middle East policy for, for many years. And I, I think also that, that some of these Democrats are uh, a bit nuanced here in terms of their arguments, but I think it's valid to, to, to recognize that 
the Palestinian people and Hamas are two different groups. Hamas has exploited the Palestinians terribly for the past uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, they, they've uh, built their bunkers and their military facilities underneath hospitals and schools, and they've basically used the Palestinians as a shield against outside attack while they engaged in a lot of terroristic behavior. Uh, so I think the exploitation of the Palestinians as a people has been a cause for the Democrats for many years. And the solutions to, to what we can do about that and how they've been exploited, uh, and, and arguably in some respects by Israel, but, all, but more recently and more pervasively, I think, by Hamas and Hezbollah, uh, you know, these, these poor Palestinians, in many respects, uh, are, are worthy of, of some sort of protection and concern. Now, uh, so I think that that's the nuance here that the Democratic Party, in some respects, is engaged in. And I think it's a, it's a worthy debate to have. Uh, but uh, I, the other fear I have is, is as we continue to, to uh, distance ourselves from the, the lessons of the Holocaust and and the establishment of the Jewish state in 1947. I think we've lo- lost and forgotten a lot of the lessons. Mr. Height. Um, I, I like what Mike said. That I think there's, um, I think there's the perception that the Jewish population was more liberal and democratic for a long time uh, uh, um, in the past. Um, and I still see that the older Democratic population still supports um, the Jewish population and Israel. But I don't see that with the younger, more liberal population. It, it seems like they're going to the other side, that they, more, they are more um, pro-Palestinian than they are pro-Israel. Um, so I, I get, and, and that could be a perception, but that's what is sort of seen um, in today's America, uh, that, that the, the youth are more pro-Palestinian. With, with what Joe said with the two-state solution, we've talked about a two-state solution for years and years and years and years, even go back to 1947. We spoke of a two-state solution back then. The problem is the Palestinians are not okay with a two-state solution. It has never been the Israeli that is is the problems. The Palestinians have rejected a two-state solution every single time it has been presented to them when it was presented in 1947, when it was presented after the the Eight-Day War, all those different times that there have been conflicts and people have tried to go in and say, we want a two-state solution. It's been the Palestinians who said the Israelis have no right here at all. There cannot be an Israeli state. That there's Palestinian state, period, that's it. So if, if you have a group that's not willing to have the two-state solution, one, one side is not willing to do that, you, it's never going to be a viable solution if only one side is okay with it. Mike, Mike. I think you're mistaken about that. Yeah, so. um, the, the particular type of two-state solution that has been proposed is one that says that Palestine is not allowed to have an army or a police force. So that's really not a state. Uh, secondly, uh, there are, have been some Arabs that have opposed a real two-state solution, but it hasn't been the Palestinians. It's been some other governments in the Middle East up until now. And I think most of them have come around uh, at this late date that, that you could have a two-state solution. And, and, and the, uh, one more point, and that is if you don't have one, the situation becomes untenable for Israel. Because about about a third of Israel right now, the third of the population, is Arab. And it is growing. Uh, if you get to the point where there are more Arabs, and some of them are Muslim, some of them are Christian. Mm-hmm. But if you get to the point where there are more Arabs than Jews, you essentially no longer have a Jewish state. So the only way to preserve the Jewish state is to have that two-state solution. And also, Mike, I think you overstated as well. Uh, in 1947, there was an extension of a two-state solution, but the second, the Palestinian state was controlled by Egypt and Jordan. And in 1967, 68, Egypt and Jordan backed off, leaving this this void, if you will, without any leadership. Uh, but there, but Israel has not been, my recollection, has not been the. Uh, uh, 
let's say Palestine's not the only one that has rejected the two-state solution. Israel has also obje- objected to this two-state solution uh, in more recent times. Yeah, Netanyahu has categorically rejected yeah. it, yeah. but but not historically they have agreed to a two-state two-state solution in the past. So, it, Palestine is uh, Palestinians have said no every single time. No, not Palestinians. No, it's primarily been other governments in the Middle East. Yeah. Mike, Carl comes back to you. Well, that last uh, comment uh, from John was uh, raised what I wanted to say. Something, uh, one group that hasn't been mentioned here is Iran. And they are anti-Jewish, anti-Israel. And it, it, you, you talk about two-state, three-state. The, the independence of a state of Jews and, you know, and the, the population's evolving in terms of religion, but it, but the independence of Israel is hated by Iran, and that Iran has been encouraged, and here's the U.S. political angle, by the last two Democratic presidents we've had. I disagree with that. Yeah, but Mike is right about Iran. Iran, I think, is instigating this whole problem. Absolutely. Yes, he's, he's right about that. Yes. All right, get your final thoughts together here.